A priest, a rabbi, and a football player walk into a bar. Everybody knows every joke that starts that way today. Well, we decided to be humorous in the title today. We've got an ETF, an asset manager, a VC, and of course, someone from a token walking into a bar to have a friendly conversation about the state of the cryptocurrency market and what we can look forward to or maybe be afraid of in 2023. I've got Dave, Vinit, and Matthew here to discuss. You guys don't want to miss this one. Let's go. Let's go. What is up, everybody? I'm Scott Melker, also known as the Wolf of All Streets. Before we get started, please subscribe to the channel and hit the like button. The jet lag is hitting me hard at the moment. I was in Dubai, as you guys know, hanging out with one of our guests today, Vinit, for the second time. Seems that every time I leave the country, there he is. I met him at uh, Token 2049 in Singapore, and he was the first face that I saw when I walked in to the hotel in Dubai. So it's always fun to have friends here. I'm going to go ahead without further ado and bring everyone. On. I've got Dave, Vinit, and Matthew. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining today. There's a lot happening right now in the crypto space. Dave, I want to uh, address you first. I found it very interesting. Of course, we saw yesterday that Tether's backing was reported. Seemingly, they've really made an effort to be fully backed. But I was also surprised to find out over the past few weeks, I've seen it reported, that the majority of Tether movement is on Tron. Uh, it certainly is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, probably really since uh, for the last few years since I've been around, nearly half of the Tether volume runs through the Tron network. Um, so when you look at stable coins overall, the total stable coin market, nearly a quarter of all stable coin volume uh, trades on Tron. And when you think about why, um, why that is, that a, a small, relatively small chain like Tron, who we have about a 5.6 billion market cap relative and Ethereum's, I don't know, at least 10 times that. How do we have a larger market share than uh, a chain like Ethereum? It's because uh, we have significant competitive advantages. We're low cost, we're fast, and most importantly, I think, um, we're, it's reliable. When you talk to people in the industry, when you talk to people who are often trading stable coins and doing a lot of activity or have a lot of activity in the space, they'll say Tron just works. And that's why we are able to capture such an outsized share of the stablecoin business. And we're, we're really looking to grow. Um, as you know, Justin uh, has been um, bringing countries online, talking about um, making TRX legal tender. Uh, we're already legal tender in the Caribbean in Dominica, as well as uh, the Dutch side of St. Martin. There are, are, there's expected to be a few more countries coming online um, over the course of the year. And, uh, you know, I, I really could see uh, Tron being the underlying chain for a lot of these CBDCs that governments are discussing. Okay, so I'll stop Vinid, there. Yeah, Vinid, I, think... I want to ask, go ahead. Yeah, please, because yeah, we sure. were just talking right before this that stable coins are sort of the undiscussed key use case for crypto for people in countries that perhaps don't have access to dollars. But I'll let you go ahead. Sure. So, you know, again, uh, when I look at the crypto industry and how we have seen it evolving, you know, I always give this phrase that 2017 was all about building up ICOs. 2020 was all about building ICOs and use cases. And 2024 will be all about ICOs, use cases and adoption. Now, thing is, adoption comes from use cases. And one of the biggest use cases around is uh, the stable coin use. When you look at Zimbabwe today, just to counter the inflation, they're using USDT. When you look at Lebanon, People don't have access to their money at the moment. Banks are, don't exist. Uh, this is where a thing like a stablecoin really adds value because, you know, uh, you get the yields as consistent with the U.S. Okay, I don't believe in those 20% yields, but uh, having a use case where people can access 3 4% uh, yields like in the U.S. and can use a stablecoin through a card or through any 
uh, financial uh, product is is definitely a use case and that's where things like tron come in in fact uh, when dave was mentioning that uh, majority of usdt is done on uh, tron i think uh, the key reasons why i have always used them is one it is fast you know during uh, ethereum during bull runs ethereum suddenly starts getting crowded and it takes time to uh, send a transaction through secondly that cost per transaction is very less you know a dollar uh, in terms of usdt compared to uh, sometimes paying 40 50 100 dollars in ethereum that's where the value add comes and uh, i think uh, there is a trust that has been built around the tron chain uh, about usdt so i think this is definitely something that uh, will bring a lot more adoption uh, than other things that will come across in the future. Matthew, what do you think? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think we should set the stage uh, about kind of where we are in the markets right now. It's been a really ferocious rally. It's been led by a number of kind of sub themes, uh, perpetuals, liquid stake derivatives, AI related tokens. Uh, and like the macro environment has improved a little bit, right? If you look at money supply growth, it's zero in the US, but it's accelerated quite a bit driven by China and Asia globally. So, you know, BTC has been highly correlated to money supply, global money supply bottomed in early November, along with Bitcoin price, uh, China's printing, Japan's printing, uh, crypto's outperforming during Asian hours, uh, not so US hours. So like, I think US investors are over indexing on some of the regulatory issues coming out of the SEC and missing what is a pretty like continuous adoption story in EM. Like how many folks saw what happened in Nigeria over the weekend, people rioting and protesting because they can't get their money out of the bank. Look on Google Trends for buy Bitcoin versus buy gold in Nigeria. Um, look at the demographic pyramid of Nigeria versus like Germany. Um, so I think that story is just consistent adoption in EM, slightly better macro backdrop. Uh, and, you know, now we just got to find what are those next narratives for for this year. Uh, you know, I'm a little skeptical that these AI tokens can continue to double every day. So, you know, we're looking at uh, layer twos. Maybe the economics may shift around what layer twos will take um, once we get some of these ETH upgrades. We're looking at some of the gaming tokens that are um slated to come out this year uh, and we're doing some work on on real world assets so those are some of the themes uh scott you introduced us as an etf sponsor that that's definitely true but since we could never get a spot bitcoin etf off the ground in the u.s because of the intransigence of these regulators you know we we pivoted and we're doing a lot of things in the private space we got a lot of venture investments we've got three actively managed funds uh out of new york uh, and then in europe where regulation is easier we've got the etns does that mean that regulation is the narrative right now? I mean, is that all there is uh, effectively worth discussing if you're in this industry in the United States? Uh, well, if you're a regulated institution in the United States, then uh, it's consuming quite a bit of time, right? So there's definitely coordinated multi-agency um, uh, attempts to kind of slow down the on and off ramp uh, in the US, right? You can see it with some of these banks withdrawing from the market. Now there's gonna be some investment banks that come in and, and fill the hole, uh, but they are largely mid tier right now. So that's in my opinion, why we didn't see a big balance sheet step up and uh, you know recapitalize like a DCG. They went, they didn't raise money yet at the parent level. Um, it's still kind of sorting it out at the at the genesis level with with no new no new capital. So U.S. side, yeah, regulation is a big deal. Globally, less so. Scott, something just wanted to have, you know, every time we start a discussion on crypto, U.S. definitely takes center stage. But isn't, uh, you know, for personally, I think adoption in crypto is going to come from everywhere else. Uh, trading or investing money in crypto, uh, personally, I don't think is a use case. And yes, U.S., we have to give uh, respect to U.S. that that's where a lot of crypto volumes also come from. But Shouldn't we also talk about the whole world when it comes to crypto adoption and just not specific to U.S.? And uh, don't you think that the next revolution is not just U.S. centric? It's going to come from Africa, going to come from Latin America. All the use cases wasn't Philippines the place where Axie Infinity grew, but it wasn't the U.S. per se. So uh, what's your view? You know, I would love to hear you guys as well on this. Yeah, I mean, in, in my opinion, it's sort of hard for Americans who have access to the global reserve currency and a robust banking system to care as much as people who actually need it in foreign countries. So I agree that adoption will 
come from a groundswell in places where crypto is actually saving lives on a daily basis, whether that's Bitcoin or or Tether or, or, or what it is. And yeah, I mean, that's my take. Dave, I saw you were sort of eager yeah. to jump in. No, I definitely uh, agree with Vanit. I think that's a good point. And I think um, crypto adoption will be helped around the world by as tokenization becomes more pervasive, right? And the uh, capability to tokenize uh, personal data, personal creations, um, and monetize that information, I think is really critical in crypto adoption as well. And, you know, along with that, um, raising millions of people out of poverty. So that's, uh, that's kind of how I view that. And I think really, uh, uh, as more and more, as tokenization takes hold, as Web3 develops, uh, that's really, I think, going to be one of the big drivers of crypto adoption, as well as its use in daily transactions. And I think that's where everyone wants to get. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be the cold water on this, and I agree with the EM story, but if you look at where the largest remittance carters are, like they include the U.S., right? And so, yes, Philippines just, um, what, onboarded Lightning Network via Strike, but not from not from New York, right? So that just the, from the quantum of dollars perspective, you do want to see some integration with developed markets. Uh, you know, sure. that's been set back somewhat with the FTX and this administration, uh, you know, we're optimistic it's going to change over time, but just want yeah. to acknowledge that, you know. Well, I think in the U.S., I think adoption will be a little different. I think it'll be driven by traditional companies shifting into Web3 and using tokenization and NFTs really um, to, as, as tools to reinvent their business models. Um, and that's what I think is really going to drive U.S. adoption. So there's kind of two different things at play there. But Matt, I have a question for you, uh, more economy focused. You mentioned uh, uh, about, about the money supply not growing. So my question is, you know, right now the yield curve in the U.S. is inverted, um, probably to historic levels. So as so obviously uh, we've probably been in a recession for a while, we'll continue to be in a recession. But what's your expectation on how crypto performs uh, as the yield curve steepens in those transition periods are you know will it be will the correlation with equities really increase during that time uh i mean so our our expectation is that eventually the fed will join this money printing party right which like japan now it's rumored that their next boj governor is going to be more on the dovish side that the yen sold off on that a couple days ago like china is clearly printing again uh whether it's the debt ceiling uh which will um cause a government shutdown or, or um, uh, the easing of inflation or some type of accident like with employment or just the economy um, going into recession, uh, you know, the Fed is likely to be taking its foot off the off the break and then we'll have money growth reaccelerate in the second half. And so, you know, I put out some predictions in December. One of them was that Q1 would be a tough quarter for Bitcoin. That was obviously quite wrong. Um, at, but the thesis was that the second half would be um, easier money and the correlation M2 and Bitcoin would remain high and that we could get back to like 35, 40 K by the end of the year. Um, so, yeah. To be fair, the quarter's not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> Again, a funny part over here was, uh, you know, if you, Scott, if you ever look at my Twitter, I had projected something with the associates on in August. And if you look, 99% of those projections were hit. Uh, getting on a point that, you know, the economy is going to improve and things like that. Guys, hasn't, hasn't the money been out of the market for a year now? If you look at Bill Gates keeping his money out and not investing, a year, a year has gone by. Do you think money will keep remaining in the wallets and in the banks for more than two years? I think... This has to go back up someday, uh, and it's uh, one year, eighteen months is good enough time for the markets to bounce back. Yeah, I mean it Again, depends, no one... right? You got to you got to tell me what happens to T bills because if T bills are at five percent and ETH staking yields are at five right. percent, that is just not going to draw in much capital. So uh, either we have to see real on chain activity pick up significantly, which is starting to happen, right? Ethereum contract calls are at an all time high. Bitcoin transactions moving in the right direction. Fees are, you know, got these ordinals uh, taking up some of the fees. So things are moving in the right direction, but uh, we'll have to see some follow through, I think. 
Should I get a Bitcoin maxi on here to uh, argue with you whether ordinals are a good or a bad thing? Or should we just skip that one on this, on this stream? But, uh, that's been the funniest debate to me on, on Twitter. But Vinit, you made the point, obviously, that adoption is going to come from other countries. I mean, we all know that a lot of countries look to the United States to lead. So they're likely just waiting for regulation here to mimic that same regulation. But you're in Dubai. Right. They got we got another set of clarity yesterday from Dubai regulators, or at least uh, sometime this week. What's it like being there where you don't think about any of this? So, again, you know, when you look at Dubai for years. Really uh, in front of everyone in in terms of, you know, trying something out new. I think in 2008 crash, when uh, Dubai was completely routed, we were like, how does this get back up? And, you know, we, people in Singapore in the financial markets considered Dubai to be the phoenix, which rises up from its uh, ashes. And that's where, you know, COVID was a boom for us, where Singapore closed down. But these, the guys in the, the people in UAE were open to crypto, came up with uh, regulations that were uh, helpful to people. And how do we see it is, I'm actually seeing a lot of people shifting to this place. In fact, as you said, you we had the big one of the biggest conferences known as the Satoshi Roundtable just a few days back. You know, people are using Dubai as a place to set up things. Setting up the licenses is pretty easy. Meeting other people, being at events, everything is so easy. So for us, I think uh, taxation is not there. So that is another advantage. We are the Puerto Rico, uh, the Asia and Middle East. So I think uh, it's it's quite helpful, and I'm seeing a lot of positivity around it. It's just that. Uh, whenever I go to these conferences, I've been on conferences for the last five, six months. Uh, people really want to know how they can set things up and set go uh, things going over here. And that's what education needs to come in. But otherwise, I think uh, we all are pretty positive of Dubai uh, emerging as a hub, uh, probably better than Singapore. And uh, no stress in building up something. Licenses exist. Government is ready to help. Uh, even they are themselves implementing all these technologies in their own transactions. So, you know, great place to be in uh, Recommend everyone to try it out once. Hey, Dave, so, I mean, me, you talk about really quick. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you go. But we, you obviously talk about Tron becoming legal tender in the Caribbean and all of these places. How concerned then are you with the regulator in the United States? Because Tron has to be one of the bucket of coins that could be blindly deemed a security one day. And right. uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's I think that's a really good question. I think right now I'm probably more. I don't know if concerned is the right word, but uh, more interested in how the potential um, banning of uh, retail level staking would impact not only Tron, but the market in the U.S. Um, it's not a ban of the... retail level staking, right? It's it's it, it, it's it's if. Coinbase provides staking services for uh -huh. on behalf of customers, then that would be a security potentially, right? Is, is what okay. Brian Armstrong is tweeting about. But it's not going to stop anyone from staking directly to the protocol using self custody right, wallet, et cetera, right? That's like that, great yeah. clarification. I, I hadn't known that. Um, yeah. So, uh, wouldn't that just push investors to stake offshore or outside of the US? I mean, or through another channel, right? So Coinbase is a is a centralized exchange, right? Wouldn't they just go to a DEX or something else? Yeah, I would guess that Coinbase might have to um, either be registered as a broker dealer, which is like they haven't been able to clear that with the SEC. There's that catch 22 where Gary says come in and register, and then it's physically impossible to fill out the forms, and they never give you the clearance. So they could and they create to one. see you. And they yeah, threatened to see you just the exactly. record yeah, at the end. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that you're right, though, that it will just push uh, activity into foreign centralized exchanges or to, for those who were motivated will be motivated to, you know, download a self-custody wallet and figure it out. Uh, but right. over the near term, it probably lowers the market opportunity. I think 11% of Coinbase revenues is staking related. Uh, so it's been a big growth area. Um yeah, and then, I, I mean, it sounds like it would then evolve uh, more to like venture investing to where you have to be an accredited investor or something like that. So then isn't it then pushing the retail level investor out of a potentially lucrative market? Yes. Right, you're kind of closing the door on that whole space. <laughs> Americans can't do anything. I, that, that's the bottom line, land of the free, home of the brave. But we're so restricted, especially if you're not wealthy that it's absolutely yeah. pointless to even try. 
We can't right. trade most of the coins. You can't invest in venture capital. You can't invest in early seed. I mean, you can't invest in your friend's pizza business if you don't have a million dollars in the bank, right? So it's not, this is not something that's inherent to crypto. This is an accredited investor problem, which, you know, is under the veil of protecting people, but actually it just allows opportunity to rich people and not to poor people. Right. Well, and then you add people. in all of this, and then you add, add in all of the regulatory burdens that we're experiencing right now. It's no mystery to Vinny's point that everyone's moving to Dubai or trying to right. do business in Dubai. That doesn't help a retail investor, but there's no reason to operate here in the United States. But again, you know, adding to that point, a lot of people who are big in crypto are already sitting on Puerto Rico as well as, I don't know if we have any data on how much is Coinbase used compared to a decentralized staking platform like an Aave or a Compound, which doesn't require KYC. This whole uh, argument depends on the fact that majority or 90% plus people are using a centralized platform like Coinbase to stake. Uh, but I think that uh, I personally as well use decentralized exchanges. I wouldn't go to a, after what happened with FTX, I would never ever land up on a centralized exchange. So it assumes that everyone, majority of the people use a, a Coinbase right now, even in the US. I mean, Matthew, can you speak to that at all? I don't know if you have data on that. Yeah, I mean, you obviously said that 11% of Coinbase's revenue themselves is via staking. I, I would, I would, Assume that Vinny's correct that most people who are savvy enough to stake or have even heard of it are probably doing it on their own. Yeah, I'm looking at a chart of market share of ETH staking. We track this, you know, very regularly given some of our holdings. So Lido has a 29% share. That's your decentralized option. Coinbase, 14% share. Kraken, seven. Binance six. So you know, just to repeat, numbers. like Lido, 29%. And then the next three, Coinbase, Kraken, and Binance are 28% combined. Uh, and then you've got a like more than a dozen that take up the tail, all like kind of 3% or less, Stakefish, Figman, Bitcoin Swiss, Rocket Pool, et cetera. So it's a pretty fair fight right now between uh, the centralized and, and the decentralized. And um, you know, you have to think what Brian tweeted last night uh, is somewhat of a negative if it, if it comes to pass. Yeah. I want to play devil's advocate here and ask you guys a question that I previously would have probably never dared to ask that just popped into my mind. And this is not about the assets themselves, but the crypto industry. And talking about adoption around the world and all the positive use cases. But as we stand in 2023, do you believe that the crypto industry has helped or hurt more people on this planet? That's a good question. question. I mean, I'm going to say hurt. Definitely For the record, I would say hurt, but uh, you guys can go ahead and jump in. Haven't you I seen Shawshank Redemption, that. Scott? You've seen Shawshank Redemption, right? Hope is the most powerful thing. And, uh, you know, the, the, you can DCF uh, hope with a very long duration and still have a large valuation. And, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a timing element. Yeah. yeah. I, think, if you, I, I think if you look at investing in a very compressed time frame, you could really ask that about any market. You could ask sure. it about equities or you could ask it about fixed income or uh, ETFs, not, not Van Eck ETFs, but maybe other ETFs. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I think, you know, if you look at anything in a compressed enough time frame, it, uh, you could draw different conclusions. I would say you have to look at it over a longer period of time um, to really get the accurate picture. Yeah, 2022 would have been hurt, right? But yeah, since I, inception, I, 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 I think, think we're right, still I'm solidly in the, the green. Right, I just maybe right. perhaps that was what I'm getting at. The net washout from 2022, if you were on Voyager, BlockFi, Celsius, FTX, I mean, who wasn't, right? But maybe the really hardcore simply self-custody were unaffected. But I think even, especially at FTX, a lot of people who really believed in crypto and were crypto native and were very active lost all their money too. But like I said, this is not a statement about the asset class or the underlying assets at all. It's a statement of the industry. Scott, you again, you, when you say people were hurt more, again, some, if you look at some numbers and we look at the crypto.com report, which said 400 million wallets exist, Assuming one wallet is one person, it is less than 4% of the world population out of which 90% are speculating. Again, uh, you know, speculators getting hurt is a different story than investors getting hurt. But use cases are coming and we have to look over a 10, 15 uh, year horizon where uh, in the end, all these title deeds will land upon the 
uh, chains and uh, people can lend borrow on that you know we are looking at uh, usdt being a predominant way to transact in a lot of uh, latin american Af and african countries so the when you say the hurt part against the uh, you know greatness that it can it's it's going to come it's it's a very small speculative market right now you know uh, i had done an interview a few months actually at the peak of the bull run where i said uh, we've not even started yet the adoption hasn't come and we, there were hate comments you know people said that uh, tomorrow morning btc is going to be a million in dollars but again we are too early in the sales when you look at these hurt things it is speculators who invested money on uh, you know 20% yield on a uh, on a platform is not heard of you know if people are putting that money they have not been doing their research well if people are coming to the market believing in 100xs you have to understand that we are too early and it's a highly speculative market it's like the 1980s indian stock market where everyone was jumping in we had two scams finally regulations came after 10 15 years and today it's a very stable market though you know recent days have not been great on the indian stock markets as well so i think we are too early the value case will come up uh, people are hurt yes but that the hurt is from their own not doing deep, uh, their own research uh, there are great projects out there you know it's just that they need to do a little bit more research and be uh, risk managed while investing i i agree uh, wholeheartedly which is why i gave the caveat until now right like i wouldn't be uh, doing these streams if i didn't believe what you guys are saying about the future but uh Yes, it's largely speculators that got washed out. I think the problem was in 2022, though, that, you know, companies like Celsius were advertising themselves as banks, right? And your average person who doesn't do their own research thought they were depositing their money into a bank, right? And there was no transparency as to what they were doing with that money afterwards. I'm just, I'm going to say that the reason I asked that question, and I, I, I talked about this yesterday, Vinit, you might have met with these guys as well. I met with 3AC when I was in Dubai, and I can tell you that this entire cycle is starting again as if nothing happened in the past, right? And so that's where somewhat of my disillusionment or questioning directly again, comes from. Did you Have you met with them? You're in Dubai. I met Sue, I met Sue for a lunch a few days back. Again, I come from the startup background. I've been doing startups for 15 years. I think it was a badly managed risk. You know, again, startups fail. Let's be clear. You know, there's this whole thing about uh, putting everyone uh, on the cross that they have done a, a, a fraud and stuff like that but startups fail there's bad risk management you know probably there was no adult in the on the table even in case of ftx where risk management has to be thought about me managing a fund everyone has been saying where to invest i have been talking about how do you manage your risk you know how do you take money off the table at the peak of the bull run we were cashing out we were up front in stages and saying that we take our profits out well everyone was saying that btc is going to go to $200000 by December point is it's about bad risk management and I think I don't know how you felt about the guys but I had you know Suzu was uh, talking normally he you know he knew he had committed a mistake and he was he clearly mentioned that they are talking to the Singaporean government and trying to resolve this whole story so if they were serious about resolving it they would be dealing with the liquidators and not avoiding subpoenas that are clearly reaching them on Twitter so uh, I, it's yeah. hard to take I mean, that seriously you know I haven't invested on them. I met them for the first time ever in my life, so I don't know the backstory. But I mean, I come on, that, that is the backstory, right? They ignored the requests to deal with the liquidation and put their head in the sand. And, uh, you know, that's not a responsible way to manage money. That's not how a fiduciary acts. So uh, that's well documented. While, while raising money, and I should mention, it took them about five minutes to raise their entire raise for their new exchange. So clearly, uh, there's plenty of people still willing to bet on them. While raising money, for which GTX, which they openly admitted, we literally only named it. Kyle said this to me. I said, GTX, are you trolling? Like, is that a joke? And he said, yes, it was literally a joke to get PR. We've now renamed it Open Exchange. And they're, in the meanwhile, selling Flex Token OTC, right? While, to your point, Matt, <laughs> haven't paid anyone back, but now they're raising money and getting rich again. Doesn't that seem like maybe uh, we're going to repeat some of the mistakes of the past? Well, who's the we, right? Like U.S. institutional investors will not repeat those mistakes is my guess. A part of that is because of the additional scrutiny that we're getting from regulators. Uh, and part of it is just a learning curve. So, you know, let, let's see, right? Deglobalization is a big theme. Started a few years ago. Uh, we'll, we'll see how, how just how much there are uh, cracks in some of these uh, multinational institutions that set the rules of the road. But I don't think U.S. institutional investors are giving Kyle Davies any money anytime soon. 
I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, the, I don't think they could if they even wanted to at this, at this point. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it just was, a, like I said, sort of disillusioning. But let's then talk on a positive note, because that's the entire point of being here. What is being built right now? What is exciting you? Where do you think the next levels of adoption will come from? Yeah, Matt, you made a joke sort of about uh, AI tokens won't double every single day. I once again think that we're doing the whole, uh, you know, DeFi summer, uh, metaverse fall, AI winter bubble trend here, right? Uh, so where do we think that the next wave will come from? How do we actually reach a higher level of adoption? Anyone can jump in. So personally for us, I think uh, DeFi would be a play, you know, People in non-stable countries like in Africa and uh, Latin America are looking at ways to gain money. You know, uh, the biggest example I use is the Argentinian peso losing 95% of its value. So technically someone who had 100 peso has just 5% worth. Maybe a USDT and a platform which gives them 3-4%. I'm not talking about those 20% uh, crazy returns, but 3-4% match to the US returns can be value as such. Uh, digital identity can be a value. I don't want to name a project and talk about something, but I know there's a Sam Altman project which is talking about building identities of each individual into a hash, which can be used later to verify uh, transactions and people. Things like that, I think, have value. Uh, this is pure play from the adoption perspective. There are definite layer ones which are trying to do uh, ecosystem building. You know, There's this whole story that people talk about that we'll make 10 million transactions a second, but hasn't that happened in 2017? It's not about transactions, but it's about building the ecosystem. How quickly can you get valuable projects on board your chain? So uh, there will be definitely L1 place. This is from building adoption case. But I also look at the market and there is this speculative cases which will take market up. You know, they can be NFTs, they can be metaverses. Uh, but if it's just about adoption, those initial three ones would be great. Uh, the second two would be ways to uh, make great returns for funds. But I would Personally, I, I would invest, but I might not fully believe in that idea. Uh, Dave, you're probably the best person to answer this because that's literally your job at Tron, right? Uh, yeah, I, I lead ecosystem development here in the U.S. for Tron. Um, but I, I think the digital identity use case is really going to push adoption further um, as a tokenization of a wide variety of assets. Also, integration of blockchain with other technologies. Like Tron just rolled out our AI development fund. Uh, you know, I think it's a billion dollars um, to invest in AI proje projects. Now we're expanding our ecosystem. Um, I guess you would call that horizontally um, into other technologies, right? So we're really um, broadening the scope of our ecosystem um, to encompass a wider range of possibilities. And I think that integration with other technologies is, is also going to be something that uh, helps push adoption. I, I think it's three, I guess, three things. Uh, one is, you know, it's always there. It's, it's Bitcoin and uh, emerging markets and frontier markets using Bitcoin as like a negotiating tool uh, as they deal with the IMF and the US dollar. And I, I was quite encouraged to see the big Bitcoin mining deal being done in Abu Dhabi, uh, you know, 250 megawatts. That's that's not a small project. Um, there are special economic zones that we're expecting to be announced in Saudi um, this year. That could catalyze the first Saudi crypto exchange licenses. Vinny, you'd know better than me on that, but yeah, uh, we, we have you. <laughs> we, <laughs> so yeah, so in that space. I'll let Matt finish. Yeah. And then, yeah. So that like one is just Bitcoin. The second is, is payments and especially uh, leverage some of these zero knowledge tech advancements to automate, uh, you know, payments and visa experimenting with account abstraction. Like, it, although ZK has been, you know, hot for several quarters now, some of the uh, main net releases are still ahead of us. Uh, so that, you know, that should catalyze some innovative work on, on real time payments. Uh, and then uh, Web2 companies experimenting with, with loyalty programs, as you guys have been talking about, you know, um, Starbucks and Stripe and 
and uh, Instagram. Uh, we now count more than half of uh, the Fortune 500 have some type of uh, Web3 partnerships. Um, so that just continues to grow. Uh, stable coins would be a big part of that. And in the, in the US, we'll need some, I think, some regulatory help to, to really bring that to mass adoption. But we've got some investments in Latin America um, where you know that's less necessary. The regulation is sufficient. Yeah, Vanit, isn't that uh, mining operation you? <laughs> so interestingly, yeah, because you mentioned that uh, the mining operation is being run by uh, Cypher Capital's parent, which is Phoenix Technology. We had, if you uh, look at the news, uh, a year back, we had ordered $650 million worth of miners. Uh, we're building that $2 billion mining plant. And anyway, we have over uh, 800 megawatts across, spread across US and Canada already. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the thing with Bitcoin mining per se, this is what I feel it, that it's, it's, you know, in, in crypto, it's all of, in anywhere in the world, it's about asset building and cash flow building. I think mining is an amazing cash flow building activity. You cannot think, you know, it's not a hundred X, but it gives you that two, three, four percent a month in a, in a good market. It's, it's a great business to be in for us and gives us enough cash flow to keep on investing without stressing on marketing, market conditions. It's Interesting. It's a good business for you guys to be in, but it hasn't been a great business for the uh, publicly traded American miners. That is because see, that is because of the poor risk management. See, under, see the problem again. This is what I have been telling to people again and again that it's not about returning multiples, but about uh, risk management. You know, when BTC was at sixty thousand dollars and seventy thousand dollars, and these miners were available for twenty thousand dollars, these companies went took leverage and bought those miners. And they were ready to pay electricity prices of eight cents, you know, and when I was trying to buy my own miners, this guy said, oh, eight, one cent difference in price is just $20. How does it make a difference? And my whole point was, what happens when BTC falls? This $20 will take me negative. This is where they didn't understand, you know, when the bull market is going on, when the snowball is affecting, people forget all about risk management. And the reason is over leverage. The reason is buying uh, at markets which are completely up there so it's not it's, it's bad risk management that's all that is there's nothing wrong with the business as such so uh, Vinay, since you were involved in the uh in, in that marathon deal it sounds like what what's the f fuel stock for that for that bitcoin mining no. what are you paying for electricity is the government subsidizing it because electricity prices in abu dhabi are not cheap um they are heavily subsidized already i, I was just curious what role the government's playing in, in uh, making this energy affordable so I'm not associated with the marathon deal. It's the Phoenix technology deal, which is that $650 million worth of miners that are coming. We are setting the end up end to end of uh, the process. Uh, I, because I'm running the VC fund for uh, uh, Phoenix, I'm not, I should not be answering the questions on electricity prices and subsidy of this thing. I can, you know, I would r rather prefer not to answer this because I, I wouldn't like to answer something that is not right. I'm, I'm really sorry. Yeah, I can check for but, you, but I cannot answer it directly. It's, it's interesting, though, what you just described, Vinit, I think, extremely eloquently about the mining space and risk management. It describes everything and everyone through the entire bull run, I think. I, I, have, I personally have 100 peta hashes under me. That is 1,400 miners. I made anywhere from 15 to 25 percent. I can actually show you with data. And I switch them off when it's not profitable and I have not leveraged it up. It works. It's, it's Someone doesn't have to come to me to prove it. It's just that, you know, I was always given this option of buying electricity in uh, US and uh, Kazakhstan at 10 cents. I was told that I can get 70% uh, loans on buying more miners. You know, if, if my 1400 miners cannot give me a million dollar a month, I'm pretty sure my 14,000 miners are not going to go take me anywhere. So for me, it's about risk management more than the multiples that makes sense so what uh, dave i don't think uh, what well, yes we did actually discuss um matt i want to ask you because you sort of casually earlier mentioned that van eck was looking at crypto gaming and that sort of uh struck me as a surprise so what are you looking at in that space because i think that's been one of the hottest narratives and still remains one of the hottest narratives for adoption moving forward uh, yeah, I mean, so the, we, tr we have an analyst who's dedicated solely to uh, playing all these games. So we're tracking awesome. like every week. Can I get week. that job? Can I be <laughs> his uh, assistant? Me too. <laughs> He's half a year old his age. Uh, you so? know, what we found, what we found from from 
tracking and playing all these games last year is that the vast, vast, vast majority were not fun. Uh, yeah. And there was no interesting tokenomics. So there's no reason for the gamer to stick around and hold on to those tokens. The gamer is heavily incentivized to just dump them. Uh, and so what you end up with is like no type of number go up. Uh, and yeah, w- what is changing a little bit uh, this year is that you've got some well-funded um, kind of AAA game, uh, high production value, more interesting tokenomics coming out on purpose-built Ethereum layer twos and layer threes. So we just published a big piece on Alluvium uh, and Immutable X. Um, you know, we're pretty bullish about that type of project uh, and think there's going to be a reason for the gamers to, to stick around on that chain rather than just dumping it, you know, partially because the game is fun and there's a big budget behind it and partially because the, the tokenomics and the integration with the Ethereum stack uh, is better. So it's still really a rifle shot approach. Um, the the sector as a whole is not really working. Uh, it's the worst performing category of coins that we track, but there are a couple of interesting uh, projects that we've been uh, accumulating some, some is coins it, in. Is it the worst performing because of the benchmark time period? Because obviously it had its bubble, so it's going to, when when that bubble pops, which is to my point about the AI tokens, depends on the starting date from when you're tracking, correct? Because I'm not surprised by that at all. I think there was massive hype, and as you said, the games actually suck. Yeah, so. that's a very good point. So like our metaverse index has a lot of sandbox and decentralized as large components and the index began right around the time when that bubble started. But it, if you just look at the daily active users on those on those platforms and across um, Web3 gaming in general, like they've been kind of, you know, they're not that it's not growing nobody's, parabolically. Nobody's yet, using right? it. Nobody's um, using it. The peak so, was Axie, which was a same right. The peak, it, it, my anecdotally, it just seemingly the peak was Axie, which people were just playing because there was a financial incentive, which was also a terrible game. And that's what you described basically is that they were doing it for income, so they would earn the tokens and sell them. The, the, the funny thing about uh, these games is that you know when I look at my kid, he every week's a uh, week goes and buys twenty dollars of V bucks, so he actually pays the game. While in crypto game, everyone goes to make money. So, you know, it does, that doesn't make real sense. You know, if it's a real game, I am ready to pay for it, to play for it. While if it's a game, you know, and I, I think this was one of the issues we saw as well, because we've invested in uh, Phoenix Games, that is X, uh, one of the ex-mythical founders and uh, some of the team that's building up a gaming studios. It's about first building an amazing game and then building tokenomics around it. So I think one of the plays is all about Web 2 to Web 3 games which is coming out from Japan quite well. It's, you know, tokenomics come later. First, it's about the game. And then also, it's not about, just about a AAA star game, but about a gaming uh, studio that will try it because, you know, there's no guarantee that the game will succeed. It has to be, even I think if Angry Birds took 14 times before you came up with that amazing game. So uh, it has a great model. It just has to t- take time to evolve still. Dave, how much is Tron focusing on gaming? I, I I couldn't hear you, Scott. I, I asked how much uh, Tron is focusing on gaming right now, if that's one of the sort of main uh, area you're looking at for partnerships and development. Uh, I wouldn't call it one of the main areas, but it's definitely a high priority area. Uh, we have relationships with, uh, one of our closer relationships is with Gala Games, um, which is a large game maker. Um, and we expect to continue to grow that relationship. Um, yeah, so they're doing quite well um, in developing these games, and uh, you know we're looking forward to continuing to work with them. So, do you guys think that then the adoption of crypto gaming will come from someone crypto native building a triple A game, which to Vinit's point is not something we've seen, right? They do the tokenomics first and worry about the game later, or do you think that it will be from a legacy, to even call them that? game company, you know, a Call of Duty or a Fortnite that adopts crypto? Or do you think there's going to be an intersection there? That's a really interesting question. I think gaming is such a difficult space because you never know what people are going to think is fun, right? Would any, what, if you saw Minecraft before it was adopted and rolled out, would you have said, boy, this looks really fun. I think a lot of people are going to play this. Probably not. So it's really, uh, you know, you just have to try different things. So I, it's possible 
I like the idea of uh, a traditional game or a game that's already established now offering the ability to, you know, own things uh, via tokenization. Um, I think that probably it sounds like it's the path of least resistance as opposed to sure. creating something brand new um, and hoping people like it and getting adoption that way. Um, I'm going to go high conviction that the that the the, the, the next kind of $10 billion Web3 gaming company is going to be native Web3, that even though you've got like the CEO of Ubisoft, he, he called uh, blockchain gaming a revolution. Uh, Activision CEO, uh, sorry, Electronic Arts rather, uh, CEO called Web3 the future of the industry. So they get it when it comes to the talking points, but they're just trapped in this like classic innovators dilemma where Web3 gaming will be detrimental to their margins because by definition they'll be keeping like a lower take rate distributing more to players in the ecosystem and when you, you know they they get paid on EPS per share right and those time horizons are pretty short uh, and they're just not incentivized to to cannibalize their own business so with the amount of VC funding that's gone into the space in a couple of years uh, it's going to be a name that no one's heard of I would say that um, takes the cake here. The new, I mean, you're probably very I, early on some of those projects right now. I have done quite a lot of deals. Uh, last season, I had, uh, again, you know, investment and uh, ecosystem are two different things. I did quite good returns on a few games. I was in Star Atlas. Personally, I was on Splinterlands as well, which did amazing stuff. But again, I still stick to my uh, part that it would be, I'm not saying big games, but at least small, well-adopted games that would work with studios to come into the Web3 space because... Uh, you know, it's not just about shifting the game to the web. It's about getting the users to end up making these wallets. And then there are other products like, you know, you have a pre auth out of Singapore that sees to it that with an email, you can create a wallet. So there's a lot of those things that will have to come in and that will also get users uh, on board with us. Uh, I have tried the game. Some of the games, they, they, they're not amazing. So I would still stick to the fact that there will be a web 2 and web 2.5 and then finally a, a web 3 something. And then the United States regulator will come in and deem all of the in-game assets from Fortnite as securities and we'll be back at square one, right? <laughs> Don't put I mean, it past them. No, I, I, I'm not putting it past them. So uh, let's talk about regulators again then. Matt, what are the odds that we actually ever see a Bitcoin spot ETF in this country? I think we'll see it eventually, but uh, not during this regime. But uh, you can correct me as you're closer to it. Uh, I think the, the odd, well, so one, one of my predictions for this year w is that Gary Gensler is going to leave the SEC, uh, that, you know, the amount of political heat on him from both sides is uncomfortable, that he can take a victory lap with a ripple victory or settlement and either like move out or move up. Uh, the average tenure for an SEC chair is less than three years. The median is, is two years. Um, so that, you know, that, that could be a catalyst certainly if uh, uh, if the White House changes then I also think the there will be event, eventually a, a Bitcoin spot ETF so it's uh, yeah, right. so it, it's now it's just about the regime and not about it's it's somewhat inevitable it just has to be someone who understands it and so you do believe it'll happen I mean that's yeah I do, I do believe it'll happen I do believe it'll happen I can tell you who's not going to get it grayscale <laughs> Maybe that's just my opinion, but it sounds like that is a house on the verge of collapse. And I'll tell you, Vineet, that was the uh, main, that was the other main narrative that the three AC guys were pushing. I don't know if they gave you that story as well, but no, they, they, uh, they did tell me about that. Uh, just as point on the regulation parts, it's a bit controversial. I'll try to put it as, as much sugar coat it up. Uh, you know, if I will get my uh, history from the Indian stock markets, Till mass adoption of a financial instrument doesn't come, which means minimum 10 to 15 percent of the global population, regulations don't come. Governments have much more work in life than to regulate something that is managed by less than 3 percent of the world population. So overall regulations, I would I still hold my line that will come by 2030. We will talk about it in India. They've been talking about it for the last two years. It's a very controversial one. It's just that. Whenever a stock market becomes so big that a certain scam sees to it, people end up at the top of the building and jump. This is where the government step in. So I think uh, it, it, we don't have that much mass uh, movement you, behind it. It's you, very so your feeling is we did not get that with FTX and Celsius and BlockFi and Voyager, just not enough people? 
is just three percent of the world's population. Do you think that's a considerable amount? That's not even a vote bank. Like three percent of the world population. What we we are not even a billion people in crypto right now. It's it's three hundred million wallets. If I assume one is to one, one wallet to one person, this is three percent. Otherwise, it's less than two percent odd, which is nothing. You know, maybe in the U.S. there. I think the biggest number of wallets in this whole number, if you look at reports, is India as well. It's not even the U.S. So. I personally, it's a very controversial one. I am trying to as much sugar coat it up, but I think we don't have that much of a volume, number of people behind it that people will start regulating it end to end. It's it's still early. I mean, Matt, if it takes till twenty thirty for us to get regulation, do you think that people in the United States just sit on the sideline, assuming that regulation's about to come? Regulation's about to come. And- I mean, I think it's just it's more complicated than that. Like, what are you? You know, crypto is regulated in many ways at the state right. level. Like, there's a whole number of overlapping agencies that have some say in this. Uh, we just you know, are at this logger head where the SEC is calling everything a security without actually putting down on paper what are the variables that they use to create that and going through the standard rulemaking process. Uh, so I, I just, I want to like get more specific about what type of regulation when it comes to a spot ETF, it, it's not an active, um, the way that the U.S. government works in general, right, is that um, you it, it, the regulator allows something to proceed or they block it they don't say like they don't stamp it and say oh yes this is now an approved product because we are a theoretically a f- free market you know ec- economy so uh, we just need to get back to that like mainstream approach uh, uh you know there's a shipping futures etf that's not a liquid market you know that so uh, it's just a, a series of contradictions and there's time, leverage time marijuana like, yeah. yeah i mean there's like leverage marijuana etfs and i you mean yeah i actually just saw that uh from i don't know if you guys saw this uh totally pivoting but unusual whales uh on twitter uh they've launched and apparently gotten approval for an etf where you can trade uh an etf on the democratic and republican politicians portfolios but nice. no spot bitcoin etf you can trade yeah. Pelosi's trades in an actual ETF, but no Bitcoin spot ETF. Is that in uh, real time? I, or? I, I have not looked at the structure. I literally saw and laughed at the tweet uh, today. But I, I believe that this, uh, I don't want to report fake news. I'm, now I'm looking. But yeah, the U.S. is I mean, it's, it's absolutely absurd. I mean, I'm glad. I think you should be able to trade these things. But my point is. A Bitcoin spot ETF seems less controversial than that. Yes, it does. I'm glad you agree, Dave. So I don't think we'll see any regulation this year. I think with the latest roadmap from the White House that they put out, it's re- it was really just, it was, I would call it sparse of details. Oh, and dude. it was really just warnings to banks to not do, not get into crypto. Um so, you know, you could see just kind of the threats continuing to emerge. Um, and that's going to keep really, that'll keep the midsize and small banks out of everything while the larger banks um, integrate crypto, certainly on the wholesale side, and even take steps to uh, move into the retail side with it. Um, so then finally, when uh, they do get around to it, uh, small and mid-sized banks will be well behind the curve. And maybe there's a wave of uh, mergers and acquisitions. We'll see. Yeah, there's been a lot of speculation, actually, that the bank banking system is really going to be the choke point that regulators are going to focus on moving forward. I know Nick, Nick Carter tweeted something about it and had a few people somewhat confirm. And I've talked to Caitlin Long about that in the past. Of course, Custodia Bank just got uh, denied their Fed master license, which is her project. But yeah, I mean, if you cut off two or three banks from the exchanges, that that effectively crushes the United States retail investor in crypto without doing much else, right? I mean, Matt, you've got to have thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, totally agree. You know, it's 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 not a positive. Uh, And um, the OCC also said uh, that's one of the banking regulators that. like state li- state chartered banks in the business of crypto uh, were, are also you know unlikely to get 
federal charters. So that, that was the category that Silvergate was in, state charter, California bank. Um, there's a lot of eyes on this and it's going to just, I think, take time uh, for these folks to pay the ransom, pay the settlements, uh, and then get a different, different regime in here so we can move forward. So just a bunch of big fines and move on with our lives, the usual seems to be the uh that seems to be what we get in the crypto space guys we're basically up against time uh right here so any final thoughts on anything we've discussed today we'll go around the horn dave you first final thoughts um uh, stable coins will continue to be a focus area um and i think we're we're open to seeing and we expect to see further adoption of the Tron platform for stablecoin trading uh, because of what I mentioned earlier. Vineet? Uh, so for me, it would be, uh, you know, mostly a lot of retail sees uh, these uh, conversations. I think they need to focus on the use cases and the value uh, blockchain and crypto gets to the uh, world. They need to, you know, people have been, I, I met people who said, we're investing because we saw a green candle. That's not how things work. Just see the use case. If you believe in it, just uh, invest in it or just uh, follow it, just like you do stocks. The future is crypto. Uh, be on, on the bandwagon as soon as possible. Um, I'd want to say uh, rest in peace to local Bitcoins who announced yeah, that they're I shutting down that. today. One of the like OG peer-to-peer -peer platforms. Um, you know, there, there's a there's a lot of pain, uh, a lot of businesses that are shutting down that we feel for these. Are the, but I think folks out there watching need to know the, these are the types of headlines you see when things have bottomed uh, or sort of starting to bottom. Uh, and if you look back at the last three cycles, Arcana Research had a great chart on this. Um, you know, the, the we are we are right on track uh, in, in the year before this having um, it, it should be a positive year. So. Um, Money supply growth is, is reaccelerating. Inflation's coming down. Uh, everyone's bearish. Uh, you know, dollar cost average, and, and uh, you know, stick with it. That's what we're doing. God, I don't now. Now you made me want to share my screen really quick, Matt. Just to that point. I mean, if you if you eliminate literally all of the noise and every narrative and everything that's been discussed, it's literally a perfect timed bottom for a four year cycle of Bitcoin having. And if you just eliminate literally everything, the bottom came at the exact basically right time, which would have been kind of November, December, January, leading into the next half. I don't even, we don't, we, we got to go. I don't, but I happen to have that pulled up and it's exactly what you said. Dave, Benit, Matt, thank you guys so much. Thank you everybody for thank listening. Uh, I always want to share everyone's comments because they're so much fun as they're going by, but we just don't really do that on Thursday. But thank you guys for contributing in the chat. We are watching. I will, of course, be back tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time doing the week in review as we do every Friday. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. Uh, three you. of you, you're all welcome back. Everybody, go follow them. Their Twitter, uh, Dave, I think in your case, LinkedIn is in the YouTube. So, guys, reach out to them and follow them in the future. Thank you, everyone. I will see you tomorrow. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thanks. That's dope.